Greetings, everybody. Chaplain Bob Walker here. John 812. You know the deal. Uh, real quick, I wanted to apologize to everybody. I, When I was sick for those couple weeks, um, I got way behind on my emails. And I plan on catching up with everybody's emails, uh, hopefully soon. And I just got a new job. So with the uh, prices of things going up, I figured I better get back to work, you know? And oh, by the way, um, the uh, gal in the UK, London, that sent me the um, FedEx, uh, thank you very much. I owe you a couple of emails as well. And a thank you for um, the gift, much appreciated. My uh, big boss is actually from London, went to school there. So I think I'm going to show him a postcard. So, all right, well, this is going to be the continuation of Judah's Scepter and Joseph's Birthright. And we are going to read chapter, what is chapter 9, page 112. The title of this chapter is The Jews Go to Babylon and Return. And his opening Bible text is the 23rd chapter of the book of Ezekiel. And now, if anybody's interested, on uh, my playlist, I have an entire commentary on Ezekiel and Jeremiah and Isaiah, which are sadly neglected. Do you know Isaiah is the, as far as I know, it is the most quoted Old Testament book in the New Testament? Yeah, Isaiah. A lot of a lot of stuff in Isaiah. So let's get going here. Okay, let's go. Uh, Ezekiel chapter 23. The word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, Son of man. So here it is. Ezekiel's being called Son of man. Um, Jesus called himself the Son of man. Because, well, he was God in the flesh, but he took on a human body. So, verse 2, Son of man, there were two women, the daughters of one mother. And they committed whoredoms in Egypt. They committed whoredoms in their youth. There were their breasts pressed. And there they bruised the teats of their virginity. And the names of them was Ahola, the elder, and Aholaba, her sister. And they were mine, and they bare sons and daughters. Thus were their names. Samaria is Ahola, and Jerusalem, Aholaba. Bob's note here. Remember, Samaria was the capital of the northern kingdom of Israel. Jerusalem was the southern capital of Judah and Benjamin and at least a portion of Levi, the priest tribe. Judah was the king tribe. So, verse 5. And Ahola played the harlot harlot's a whore and ahola played the harlot when she was mine and she doted on her lovers on the assyrians her neighbors which were clothed with blue captains and rulers all of them desirable young men horsemen riding upon horses thus she committed her whoredoms with them and all uh, with all them that were chosen men of Assyria, and with all on whom she doted, 
with all the their idols she defiled herself neither left she her whoredoms brought from Egypt for in her youth they lay with her and they bruised the breasts of her virginity and poured their whoredom upon her Bob's note here remember Israel came out of Egypt during the Exodus under Moses God took them out of Egypt but more importantly he wanted to take Egypt out of Israel you know they brought the uh, the religious filth of Egypt with them they I guess you could say they had a lot of baggage they carried a lot of baggage with them from Egypt so uh, let's see verse I will we'll read verse 8 again neither left she her whoredoms brought from Egypt for in her youth they lay with her and they bruised the breasts of her virginity and poured their whoredom upon her verse 9 wherefore I have delivered her into the hands of her lovers into the hands of the Assyrians upon whom she doted Oh, let's stop for a minute. I hope I'm pronouncing it right. Uh, D-O-T-E. I don't think it's dot E. I think it's dot. It's an intransitive verb, according to Webster's 1828 Dictionary. Guy was a language scholar and a believer. So, when the internet goes out, it would be advantageous to have a Webster's 1828 Dictionary of English language. Dot. To be delirious, to have the intellect impaired by age so that the mind wanders or wavers, to be silly. Time has made you dote and vainly tell of arms imagined in your lonely cell. Second definition, to be excessively in love. Oh, so maybe that's why when the Lord said that Israel was doted upon her lovers, the Assyrians, to be excessively in love, usually with, on, or upon, to dote on is to love to excess or extravagance. Um, and <laughs> it's funny, um, right here in Webster's 1828, he even says a whole lot dotes on her lovers, the Assyrians, and he quotes Ezekiel 23, um, verse 5. <laughs> he quotes a lot of stuff from the Bible and tells you what it means in the word. Third definition, to decay. So, yeah, Webster's 1828. What a, what a, what a uh, magnificent book all right let's go back verse 9 Ezekiel 23 wherefore I have delivered her into the hand of her lovers into the hand of the Assyrians upon whom she doted these discovered her nakedness they took her sons and her daughters and slew her with the sword and she became famous among women for they had executed judgment upon her Bob's note here, remember the Assyrian Empire invaded Samaria and Israel and killed them, took them captive, and removed them from the land. You know, if you don't want to follow the Lord, he will, he can and will remove his protection from his people and um, and then you're in trouble because Satan's people will move right in and destroy you. So, oh, and by the way, um, um, the gal that sent me the present from Canada 
with the um, the artwork. Uh, thank you very much to you also. I almost forgot about that. Okay. Um, all right, so verse 10, these discovered her nakedness. They took her sons and her daughters and slew her with the sword, and she became famous among women, for they had executed judgment upon her. And when her sister Aholabah saw this, Judah, she was more corrupt. Bob's note here. So Israel was bad, but Judah became even worse. And when her sister Aholabah saw this, she was more corrupt in her inordinate love than she, and in her whoredoms, more than her sister in her whoredoms. She doted upon the Assyrians, her neighbors, captains and rulers clothed most gorgeously, horsemen riding upon horses, all of them desirable young men. Then I saw when uh, that she was defiled, that they took both one way. Bob's note here. Remember, the Assyrians uh, invaded Judah also and took many of the cities of Judah away. They tried to take Jerusalem, but God protected Jerusalem. If memory serves me correctly, there was an army of 185,000 Assyrians that had surrounded Jerusalem and the Lord killed them all. Yeah, and that was the end of the Assyrian siege of Jerusalem. But he took many of the cities in southern Judah captive and led them away too. Not all of Judah was taken to, into the Babylonian captivity. Some were taken into the Assyrian captivity. So, you know, back then, uh, you didn't want to just invade a country and kill everybody. I mean, hey, you know, you need workers to be uh, cooks and bakers and, you know, to the, the plow and your fields and pick your fruit and plant gardens, you know, comes in handy, right? So, so Judah and Israel were taken into Assyria. Parts of Judah, not all of Judah, but parts of Judah were taken into captivity. They took a lot of the cities of Judah. If I remember correctly, that's in the books of Kings and Chronicles. So. All right. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, verse 13, when I saw that she was defiled, that they took both one way, and that she increased her whoredoms, for when she saw men portrayed upon the wall, the images of the Chaldeans portrayed with vermilion. Uh, what does vermilion mean? It means dyed or tinged with a bright red. So, you know, dyed, not like a funeral, but uh, the coloring of clothing, uh, D-Y-E-D. Ask your mother about dyeing clothing. You know, you got a white shirt and you want it to be red. You know, you dye it with red dye. All right. Um, verse 15. Girded with girdles upon their loins, exceeding in dyed attire upon their heads, all of them princes to look to after the manner of the Babylonians of Chaldea, the land of their nativ nati nativity. And as soon as she saw them with her eyes, she doted upon them and sent messengers unto them into Chaldea. And the Babylonians came to her into the bed of love, and they defiled her with their whoredom, and she was polluted with them, and her mind was alienated from them. So she discovered her whoredoms and discovered her nakedness, then my mind was alienated from her, like as my mind was alienated from her sister. So here it is, the Lord's talking about Judah. 
you know, his mind was alienated from Israel. Now his mind's alienated from Judah. 19. Yet she multiplied her whoredoms in calling to remembrance the, the days of her youth, wherein she had played the harlot in the land of Egypt. For she doted upon their paramours. All right, Bob, what is a paramour? It's a Latin word. Uh, it means a lover. A wooer you ever heard of you know trying to woo a man trying to woo a woman's love or it could be a mistress so yeah you get the idea uh, let's see verse 24 she doted upon her paramours whose flesh is as the flesh of asses and whose issue is like the issue of horses. Ooh. <laughs> if you don't know what that's talking about, uh, let's just say it's not safe in the company of little children. Yeah. Verse 21. Thus thou callest to remembrance the lewdness of thy youth in bruising thy teats by the Egyptians for the pap, paps of thy youth, you know, the, the breasts, the woman's breasts, the paps. Therefore, O Aholabah, thus saith the Lord God, behold, I will raise up thy lovers against thee, from whom thy mind is alienated, and bring them against thee on every side. The Babylonians and all the Chaldeans, Pekod and Shoa and Koa and all the Assyrians with them, all of them desirable young men, captains and rulers, great lords and renowned, all of them riding upon horses. And they shall come against thee with chariots, wagons and wheels, and with an assembly of people which shall set against thee buckler and shield and helmet round about. And I will set judgment before them, and they shall judge thee according to their judgments. And I will set my jealousy against thee, and they shall deal furiously with thee. They shall take away thy noise and thine ears, and thy remnant shall fall by the sword. They shall take thy sons and thy daughters, and thy residue shall be devoured by the fire. Uh, Bob's note here. When the Babylonians took Jerusalem, they burned it. They set it on fire. So even though you were hiding in the city, and you didn't get captured there was a chance you were going to be burned by fire you know what good does it do to be hiding in a secret basement if the house is on fire you know verse 26 they shall also strip thee out of thy clothes and take away thy fair jewels thus will i make thy lewdness to cease from thee and thy whoredom brought from the land of egypt so that thou shalt not lift up thine eyes unto them, nor remember Egypt any more. For thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will deliver thee into the hand of them whom thou hatest, into the hands of them from whom thy mind is alienated, and they shall deal with thee hatefully, and shall take away all thy labor. You know, Bob's note here, everything you worked for is going to be taken away everything and they shall take away all thy labor and shall leave thee naked and bare and the nakedness of thy whoredoms shall be discovered both thy lewdness and thy whoredoms i will do these things unto thee because thou hast gone a whoring after the heathen and because thou art polluted with their idols thou hast walked in the way of thy sister you know judah walked in the way of israel Thou hast walked in the way of thy sister, therefore I will give her cup into thine hand. Remember when uh, Jesus said uh, uh, the Lord had given him a cup to drink from? He was talking about his, his death. 
So, yeah. Verse 32. Thus saith the Lord God, Thou shalt drink of thy sister's cup, deep and large. Uh, Bob's note here, if, it, if you're going to 7-Eleven, you're going to be drinking a big gulp. Yeah. Thou shalt drink of thy sister's cup, deep and large. Thou shalt be laughed to scorn and had in derision. It containeth much. Thou shalt be filled with drunkenness and sorrow, with the cup of astonishment and desolation, with the cup of thy sister, Samaria. Thou shalt even drink it and suck it out, and thou shalt break the sherds thereof and pluck off thine own breasts, for I have spoken it, saith the Lord God. Therefore thus saith the Lord God, because thou hast forgotten me, thou hast forgotten me and cast me behind thy back, therefore bear thou also thy lewdness and thy whoredoms. The Lord said moreover unto me, Son of man, Wilt thou judge Ahola and Aholabah? Yea, declare unto them their abominations. Abominations. Gee, Chaplain Bob, what's an abomination? That's a sin that God really, really, really hates. Yeah. That they have committed adultery and blood is in their hands, and with their idols have they committed adultery and have also caused their sons, whom they bear unto me, to pass for them through the fire to, to devour them. So here it is. They were burning their sons in human sacrifice. This was the, uh, the god, the satanic god Moloch, M-O-L-O-C-H. That was, Moloch was the one that demanded them take their children and burn them alive in fire. God said, I didn't tell you to do that stuff. Verse 38. Moreover, this they have done unto me. They have defiled my sanctuary in the same day and have profaned my Sabbaths. For when they had slain their children to their idols, then they came the same day into my sanctuary to profane it. So I guess in the morning, they're burning their children to the devil. And then in the afternoon, they're going to the house of God. Uh, how does that work for you guys, gals? For when they had slain their children to their idols, then they came the same day into my sanctuary to profane it. And lo... Thus have they done in the midst of mine house. And furthermore, that ye have sent for men to come from afar, unto whom a messenger was sent, and lo, they came, for whom thou didst wash thyself, paintest thy eyes, and deckest thyself with ornaments. You know, they, they clean themselves up. The, they, you know, did their eyelashes and their mascara and... Um, you know, put on makeup and uh, and to deck us, you know, when they say deck the halls with boughs of holly, you know, the Christmas song, uh, deck, decoration, decorate. That's what they're talking about. So they decorated themselves, you know, ornaments. They're, they're putting on their jewelry, you know, they want to look nice. And furthermore, that ye have sent four men to come from far unto whom a messenger was sent and lo they came for whom thou didst wash thyself paintest thy eyes and deckest thyself with ornaments and satest upon a stately bed and a table prepared before it whereon uh, whereupon thou hast set mine incense and mine oil and a voice of a multitude being at ease was with her and with the men of the common sort were brought Sabaeans from the wilderness. If I remember correctly, the Sabaeans were the Arabs, which put bracelets upon their hands and beautiful crowns upon their heads. When I said unto her that was old in adulteries, will they now commit whoredoms with her and she with them? 
Yet they went in unto her as they go in unto a woman that playeth a harlot. So went they in unto Ahola and unto Aholabah, the lewd women. Yep, they're playing the whore. That's what a harlot is. It's the King's English, a polite way of saying a whore. And the righteous men, they shall judge them after the manner of adulteresses and after the manner of women that shed blood, murderers, right? Because they are adulteresses and blood is in their hands. For thus saith the Lord God, I will bring a company upon them and give them to be removed and spoiled. And the company shall stone them with stones and dispatch them with their swords. Dispatch. Um, send them away. You know, when you dispatch a driver to go somewhere. Yeah, well, they're going to dispatch them with their swords. What happens when you stick a sword into somebody's chest? Uh, you're dispatching them from, from the earth to either heaven or hell. Yeah. And dispatch them with their swords. They shall slay their sons and their daughters and burn up their houses with fire. And that is exactly what happened with Jerusalem. They burned Jerusalem. Verse 48. Thus will I cause lewdness to cease out of the land. Yeah. Well, you know, when the land is empty of people, the land's not going to have any abominations anymore. So, thus will I cause lewdness to cease out of the land that all women may be taught not to do after your lewdness. And they shall recompense, you know, repay your lewdness upon you and ye shall bear the sins of your idols and ye shall know that I am the Lord God. That is the end of Ezekiel 28. Let us read chapter 9. The Jews go to Babylon and return. You know, he references this uh, chapter. That's why I wanted to read uh, Ezekiel 23 in its entirety. I mean, Ezekiel and Jeremiah and Isaiah... Uh, have some really harsh language against God's people for their turning their backs on him. And you know, I mean, you know, anybody that would take their children and burn them alive in a satanic ritual. Um, yeah, you get the point, you know. Okay, everybody, we read the um, 23rd chapter of Ezekiel. So let's read Judah's Scepter and Joseph's Birthright by J.H. Allen, chapter 9. The Jews go to Babylon and return is the name of the chapter. So I'm going to read his book now. The 23rd chapter of Ezekiel contains a short story which seems somewhat veiled, but a knowledge of the two houses, you know, Judah and Israel, of the two houses in their respective capitals lifts the veil and quickly sweeps it aside. It is of interest to us, or should be, and begins as follows. There were two women, daughters of one mother, who committed adultery in their youth in Egypt, the names of whom were Ahola, the elder, and Aholabah, her sister, and they were mine, saith the Lord, and they bear sons and daughters. Thus were their names. Samaria is Ahola, Israel, and Jerusalem, Aholabah, Judah. Ezekiel 23, 4. Then the story continues and tells how Ahola, the elder, played the harlot and was followed into that sin by her sister, Aholabah, who was more corrupt than Ahola had been. So in other words, uh, Judah became even more corrupted than Israel. So God judged them as women that break wedlock. Before the story is ended, the history of Israel's captivity to the Assyrians is told, together with prophecies concerning the captivity of Judah in Babylon. The Lord further says to the Jews, 
And thine elder sister is Samaria, Israel, she and her daughters that dwell at my left hand, and thy younger sister that dwelleth at thy right hand is Sodom and her daughters. Yet hast thou not walked after their ways, nor done after their abominations, but as if it were a very little thing, thou hast corrupted more than they in all thy ways. Neither has Samaria, Israel, committed half of thy sins, but thou hast multiplied thine abominations more than they, and hast justified by comparison thy sisters in all their abominations which thou hast done. Thou also which hast judged thy sisters, bear thine own shame for thy sins, for thou hast committed more abominable than they. And that is in Ezekiel 16, 46 through 52. This is in harmony with the record of Judah as given by Jeremiah in the following. And I saw when for all the causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery, I had put her away and given her a bill of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister Judah feared not but went and played the harlot also. And the Lord said unto me, The backsliding Israel hath justified herself more than treacherous Judah. And Jeremiah, that's Jeremiah 3, verses 8 and verses uh, 11. Boy, that ties right into Ezekiel 23, by the way. Okay, let's keep reading. And the Lord said, I will remove Judah also out of my sight, as I have removed Israel, and will cast off the city Jerusalem, which I have chosen, and the house of which I said, My name shall be there. And that's in 2 Kings 23-27. So Jeremiah was commanded to stand in the gate of the Lord's house and proclaim the word of the Lord unto all the men of Judah and, among other things, say unto them, But go ye now unto my place, which is Shiloh, uh, which is one of the cities of Joseph, where I set my name at first and see what I did to it for the wickedness of my people Israel. And now, because ye have done all these works, saith the Lord, and I spake unto you, rising up early and speaking, but ye heard not. And I called you, but ye answered not. Therefore will I do unto this house, which is called by my name, wherein ye trust, and unto the place which I gave to you and to your fathers, as I have done to Shiloh. And I will cast you out of my sight, as I have cast out all your brethren, even the whole seed of Ephraim. Now remember, Ephraim is Samaria and Israel. And that is in Jeremiah 7, 12 through 15. The above is the prophecy. The following is a part of the historic record of the fact after its fulfillment. Thus Judah was carried away captive out of his own land. This is the people whom Nebuchadnezzar carried away captive in the seven year of his reign, 3,000 Jews and uh, 3,000 Jews and 3 and 20. In the 18th year of Nebuchadnezzar, he carried away captive from Jerusalem 832 persons. In the 3 and 20th year of Nebuchadnezzar, uh, Nebuzar Adan, the captain of the guard, carried away captives of the Jews 740 and 5 persons. All the persons were 4,600. Jeremiah 52, 27 through 30. Thus doth Jeremiah teach that it was the Jews, or the people composing the kingdom of Judah, who were carried into Babylon by Nebuchadnezzar, and in order to show that it was the Jewish people, and they only who returned from the captivity, we cite the following. Now these are the children of the province, Judah, had been a province to Babylon 20 years before Nebuchadnezzar, robbed and burned the temple, destroyed Jerusalem, and took the Jews to Babylon that went up out of the captivity of those 
which had been carried away, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away to Babylon and came again unto Jerusalem and Judah, every one to his city. And that's in Ezra 2 and verse 1. Uh, if you want to read about uh, the captivity of Judah in Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar, read the book of Daniel. Real simple. All right, let's keep reading um, this book. The books of Ezra and Nehemiah are the only books of the Bible which dealt with the history of that return. Jeremiah had prophesied that the Jews should remain captives in the Chaldean Empire. Babylon was the capital of that empire for 70 years. Just as the 70 years came to an end, the empire was taken by the Medes and Persians. And it became known in history as the Medo-Persian Empire. And by the way, Bob's note here, uh, Persia became known as... Uh, Parthia, P-A-R-T-H-I-A. -A. They were contemporaries with Rome, and Rome tried to conquer Parthia, but it didn't work out. Uh, Parthia was pretty equally matched with the Roman Empire. And uh, if you read the first uh, two, three chapters of the book of Acts, uh, when they were speaking in the languages of the people in their own languages, uh, you can read about Parthians who came to Jerusalem to worship. And some people think the Parthians were Israelites. I don't know. All right, so let's keep reading the book. Ezra begins his record as follows. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it also in writing, saying, Thus said king, uh, Cyrus, king of Persia, The Lord God of heaven hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he hath charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is there among you of all his people? His God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build a house of the Lord God of Israel, he is the God, which is in Jerusalem, and whosoever remaineth in any place throughout the kingdom where he sojourneth, let the men of his place keep him with silver and with gold and with goods and with bees, besides the free will offering for the house of God that is in Jerusalem. Bob's note here. Um, if the you know who's really were Judah, Guess what? You would think they would be um, wanting to be show kindness to the descendants of the Persians. Who are the Persians today? Who are the modern day descendants of the Persians? Iran, Iranians. So, all right, let's keep reading the book. Then rose up the chief of the fathers of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and the Levites with all them whose spirit God had raised up to go to build the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem. Ezra 1, 1 through 5. Did you notice that it is only the men of the tribes of Judah, Benjamin and Levi, who are mentioned as responding to this call? Also, you will remember that those three tribes are the three which composed the kingdom of Judah, which went into the Babylonian captivity, the ten tribes having been carried away into the Assyrian captivity 130 years prior to that. Also note that it was not all the fathers, nor all of Judah, Benjamin, and Levi that rose up to this call, but the chief of the fathers and all of the people in those tribes mentioned, whose spirit the Lord had made willing. So these willing ones went to work, gathering together their silver, gold, goods, and other precious things, and Cyrus the king brought out of the house of one of the idols where Nebuchadnezzar had put them, all of the vessels belonging to the house of the Lord, through his treasurer, numbered them unto Sheshbazar, the prince of Judah. And this is the number of them. Thirty charges of silver, nine and thirty knives, 
30 basins of gold, silver of a second sort of 410, and other vessels of 1,000. All the vessels of gold and silver were 5,400. All these did Shesh Bazar bring up with him of the captivity that were brought up from Babylon to Jerusalem. And that's in Ezra 1, 8 through 11. Please note that among these things mentioned as belonging to the house of God, there is no mention of the Ark of the Covenant. There's no mention of the Ark of the Covenant. The reason is that the Ark was with the birthright people. Bob's note here. I don't know if that's true. Um, because in Revelation, it says that the Ark was found in heaven. So, I don't know. All right, keep reading. Some presume to teach that the house of Israel returned to Palestine with the Jews when they came from Babylon. We, When we get to that phase of our subject, we'll, we will prove by both the Old and New Testament that they did not. Bob's note here. Um, only modern satanic lying churches want you to think that the you know who's in the Middle East are all of Israel. And that is a damnable lie from hell. It is just not true. Keep reading. But just here we need to say that there that in the books which dealt with the history of this return, there uh, there is not the slightest mention, direct or indirect, but, or by infer inference or reference of the other kingdom or house of Israel. There is a mention of the army of Samaria by Nehemiah, but you will find that they belonged to the post-Samaritans who with others opposed and hindered the Jews in their work until finally they forced them to cease work on the temple. Here is the record. But it came to pass that when Sanballat heard that we builded the wall, he was wroth, he was angry, and took great indignation and mocked the Jews. And he spake before his brethren and the army of Samaria and said, What do these feeble Jews? And that's in Nehemiah 4, 1 and 2. Again, Now when the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the children of the captivity builded the temple under the Lord their God, Ezra 4, 1, Following these statements is the account of a prolonged persecution of the Jews by these mongrel nations of post-Samaritans. The hired counselors wrote letters of protest, resorted to trickery and hypocrisy. Now, they, uh, Bob's note here. Uh, they wrote letters to the Persians um, trying to keep the Judah from rebuilding Jerusalem and the temple. Following these statements is an account of the prolonged persecution of the Jews by those mongrel nations as post-Samaritans. The hired counselors wrote letters of protest, resorted to trickery and hypocrisy. A letter of protest was written to Artaxerxes, king of Persia, which was signed by many together with the rest of the nation whom the noble Asnapar brought over and set in the cities of Samaria. This had the effect of stopping the work on the temple, and it did not begin again until during the second year of Darius, at which time these imported Samaritans again tried to hinder. The account of this is given by Josephus as follows. When the Samaritans, who were still enemies to the tribes of Judah and Benjamin, heard the sound of trumpets, they came running together and desired to know what was the occasion of the tumult. And when they perceived that it was the Jews who had been carried captive to Babylon and were rebuilding the temple, they came to Zorobabel and to Yeshua, 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 and to the heads of the families and desired that they give them leave to build the temple with them and to be partners with them in building it. For they said, We worship your God, and especially pray to him and are desirous by your religious settlement. And, and this ever since Shalmaneser, the king of Assyria, 
transplanted us out of Kuthaf and Media to this place. When they thus said, Zerubbabel and Yeshua, the high priest, and the heads of the families of the Israelites replied to them that it was impossible for them to permit them to be their partners while they only had been appointed to build the temple at first by Cyrus and now by Darius uh, or Darius. Although it was lawful for them to come and worship there if they pleased and that they could allow them nothing but that in common with them, which was common to them with all other men to come to their temple and worship there. When the Cuthians heard this, for the Samaritans have that appellation that they they had indignation at it, indignation at it, persuaded the nations of Syria to desire the governors in the same manner as they had done formerly in the days of Cyrus and again in the days of Cambyses, C-A-M-B-Y-S-S-E-S, afterwards to put a stop to the building of the temple and to endeavor to delay and distract the Jews in their zeal about it. Bob's note, um, they appealed to different rulers trying to get them to, you know, stop building the temple. And uh, it didn't work, but this delayed matters for some time. But finally, Darius ordered a search among the royal records, which resulted in the finding of the record of Cyrus concerning the restoration of the Jews, the building of the temple, and what the Lord commanded him in reference to it. The contents of this proclamation, proclamation is given by Josephus as follows. Uh, if you don't know who Josephus was, he was a Jewish historian who lived in the time of Jesus and the Roman Empire. And he wrote as follows. Cyrus, the king in the first year of his reign, commanded that the temple should be built in Jerusalem and the altar in height should be three score cubits and its breadth of the same with three edifices of polished stone and one edifice of stone of its own country. And he ordained that the expense of it should be paid out of the king's revenue. He also commanded that the vessels which Nebuchadnezzar had pillaged out of the temple and carried to Babylon should be restored to the people of Jerusalem and that the care of these things should belong to Sanadassar, the governor and president of Syria and Phoenicia, and to his associates, that they may not meddle with that place, but may permit the servants of God, the Jews and their rulers, to build the temple. He also ordained that they should assist him in the work, and that they should pay to the Jews out of the tribute of the country where they were governors on account of the sacrifices bulls and rams and lambs and kids of the goats and fine flour and oil and wine and all things that the priests should suggest to them and that they should pray for the preservation of the king and of the Persians for such as had transgressed any of these orders thus sent to them. He commanded that they should be caught and hung upon a cross and their substance confiscated to the king's use. Bob's note here. So if anybody tries to hinder the rebuilding of the temple, they should be crucified and all their goods confiscated. Ooh boy. He also prayed to God against them that if anyone attempted to hinder the building of the temple, God would strike him dead and therefore uh, thereby restrain his wickedness. Josephus also relates another trick of these Cuthian Samaritans as follows. When Shalmaneser, the king of Assyria, had told him that Hoshea, the king of Israel, had sent privately to so the king of Egypt, desiring his assistance against him, he was very angry and made an expedition against Samaria in the seventh year of the reign of Hoshea. But when he was not admitted into the city by the king, he besieged Samaria three years and took it by force in the ninth year of the reign of Hoshea, and in the seventh year of Hezekiah, king of Jerusalem, and quite demolished the government of the Israelites and transplanted all the people into Media and Persia, among, him, among whom he took King Hoshea alive. And when he had removed these people out of this land, out of this their land, he transplanted, transplanted 
other nations out of Kutha, a place so called, for there is still a river of that name in Persia, into Samaria and into the country of the Israelites. So the ten tribes of the Israelites were removed, were removed etc. Um, that's like taking people from New York City, well, New York State, and moving them to California, and then taking people from California and moving them to New York. So, you know, it's kind of hard to make a rebellion when, you know, you've moved everybody around. So, all right, let's read. But now the Kuthians who removed into Samaria, for that is the name they have been called by to this time, because they were brought out of the country called Kutha, which is a country of Persia, and there is a river of the same name in it, and are called in the Hebrew tongue Kuthians, but in the Greek tongue Samaritans. And when they see the Jews in prosperity, they pretend that they are changed and allied to them and call them kinsmen as though they were derived from Joseph. Our object in inserting these quotations is threefold. First, to show that not only the sacred writers, but also the secular historian and the rulers, both friendly and unfriendly, who had to do with those Israelites who went into and came out of the Babylonian captivity, called them Jews. Second, to show how the bitter feelings was engendered among the Jews against those Kuthia Samaritans, whom they called dogs, whom they never forgave, and with whom they never had any dealings. When Christ spoke to the woman of Samaria at the well, she was so surprised that her first words were, were you know, the woman at the well that spoke to Christ, her first words were, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Bob's note here. Um, the woman said that she was a uh, a child of Joseph, and um, you know our father Joseph, who gave us, or our father Jacob, who gave us this well. And Jesus never corrected her. She was indeed an Israelite. That woman at the well was an Israelite, even though uh, a lot of the other people of Samaria probably were not of Israelite blood, but she was. Uh, third, to show that neither Joseph, Josephus, who writes on the antiquities of the Jews, nor their enemies, the Kuthia Samaritans, ever, ever confounds the ten tribes Israel, Israelites with the Jewish Israelites. Oh, how we do thank God that he made Josephus write concerning these important nations in Samaria, who, because they were living in the land which had been the home of the birthright kingdom, when they were seeking that which would be advantageous to them, would side up to the Jews and claim kinship as though they were derived from Joseph. What impudence! What impudence! Think of the audacity of the imported mongrels claiming to be a portion of the Abrahamic birthright holders. Is it much marvel that the Jews would? dubbed such a race of fawners by the appropriate name of dogs? Both Ezra and Nehemiah, the biblical historians of the return of the Jews from Babylon to Judea, give the genealogy of all who returned, a list of all the men who worked on the wall, a special list of all the priests who had married strange wives. And you can read about that in Ezra chapter 9. God, the, they told them to divorce their strange wives. Ezra 9. But Chaplain Bob, God loves everybody. And he wants, he doesn't care who you marry. Yeah, right. Um, both Ezra and Nehemiah, the biblical historians of the return of the Jews from Babylon to Judea, give the genealogy. Of all who returned, a list of all the men who worked on the wall, a special list of all the priests who had married strange wives, and the exact number of individuals who returned. The aggregate of this is summed up as follows. The whole congregation together was 40 and 2,303 score, besides their servants and their maids, of whom there were 7,337. Ezra states that 
There were among these servants 200 singing men and women, but Nehemiah puts the number of singers at 245. This could easily have been the case by the time he got there, for the going up, which was led by him, was the second one, and did not take place until 14 years and a half after that, which was led by Ezra. And yet in the geneal genealogical records of this whole congregation of 49,897 Jews, there is not a tribal name mentioned except those of Judah, Judah, Benjamin, and Levi. Please remember that it is the people of these three tribes who compose the mass of the kingdom of Judah and who only are called Jews. Josephus tells us of an epistle which was written by Xerxes, the son of Darius, or Darius, at the time when the Jews were getting ready to leave Babylon and sent to uh, Ezra, which was the cause of great rejoicing among them. He speaks of the effect it had upon them as follows. So he read the epistle of Babylon to those Jews that went there, but he kept the epistle itself and sent a copy of it to all those of his own nation that were in Medea, Media. And when these Jews had understood what piety the king had toward God, what kindness he had for uh, Ezra, they were all greatly pleased. Nay, many of them took their effects with them and came to Babylon as, the, as very desirous of going down to Jerusalem. But then the entire body of the people of Israel remained in that country Therefore, there are but two tribes in Asia and Europe subject to the Romans, while the ten tribes are beyond the Euphrates till now. This, and that was written in AD 95. And are in an immense multitude, an immense multitude. The, the, the ten tribes are an immense multitude and not to be estimated by numbers. We note that First and Second Kings, the Chronicles, Josephus, Ezra, and Nehemiah all speak of the kingdom of Judah at times as Judah and Benjamin. This is why Joseph said that there are only two tribes under the power of the Romans. The reason for this is supposed to be the fact that the Levites were priests who served in the temple and did not count for anything when it came to the political and fighting strength of the Jewish people, for the Levites were undoubtedly with Le uh, Judah and Benjamin as part of the kingdom of Judah. Furthermore, aside from the mention of the tribal name of Asher as the name of the tribe to which Anna, Anna the prophetess, um, Bob's note here, there was only like three or four prophetesses mentioned in the Bible. Uh, Deborah was a judge, Anna, and uh, there's... Uh, got to be another one. I think there's like three or four mentioned in the Bible. Maybe three. Uh, Anna the prophetess belonged. There is not a tribal name used in any historic portion of the New Testament except the three tribal names of the Jewish people, i.e. Judah, Levi, and Benjamin. The ancestors of Anna could easily have belonged to one of those scattered families who returned out of Israel unto the kingdom of Judah because they, they would not serve Jeroboam's calves and that is the end of chapter nine all blessings praise glory and honor to god the father and his only begotten son jesus who is the christ the lamb slain from the foundation of the world all blessings praise glory and honor In jesus precious name amen